So these are my five lectures on Bushi, five hours. And I'm going to do lower bounds and experiments today. And then for my last lecture, the sixth lecture, I do a fun thing on lesson protocol cognitive updates relation to evolution and biology, in vitro selection. I'm going to run both you in two. You'll see. It's just sure, and that's what's an update. Um, quite fun. Um, OK. So I'm going to go to this one. Are you, are you using the mic? Test, test? No, no, the video, video mic. Oh. <laughs> That is why there was this. What do you want me to do? This one also. Okay. Emergency. <laughs> now? Happy? <laughs> no feedback. Okay. So, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about lower bounds and uh, I sketched this in the last, end of last lecture. I'm going to show you an omega 1 over epsilon squared lower bound for Hadamard matrices. Um, and uh, I did this together with Vichy, a number of people recently knee helped. Um, and uh, I'm going to sort of sketch what you get for random matrices. You get a slightly improved thing, but it's restrictive and it only holds with high probability. And I'm going to talk about conjecture that the Hardamat matrices are the hardest. Oh, I have this little whizzy. OK, good. So here's the basic setup for my previous slides. Chum, chum. OK, you see, you have this huge matrix, U matrix, and you add one more column at a time. The column player was the maximizing player. As you add columns, the value of the game goes up. You understand? So that's what we had, right? The value of the game goes up. And you want to, for the algorithms, you want the value of the game to go up as quickly as possible. So here I sketch upper bound. Design an algorithm such that the value increases fast. In other words, this thing here is supposed to zoom up, zoom very fast. Ideally, you want it immediately. OK, but you can't. But then you add hypotheses. Here's the number of hypotheses. You add it, you want the value to pop up as fast as possible. OK, uh, you want the value within, ep within epsilon in a small number of iterations, right? The epsilon is this gap here, how far you are away. You see that gap? OK, so you want the value within epsilon with a small number of iterations. For our boosting algorithms, it's log n over epsilon squared iteration suffice. OK, for the lower bound, you want a particular algorithm or any algorithm such that the curve increases slowly. You want to make, it, make a problem hard. So you want to find a situation where this curve does never increase very fast. It goes up very slowly. Okay? So it's a different thing. Lower bounds are usually much harder to prove than upper bounds. Okay? Good. And the conjecture is that it requires same number, log n of epsilon squared iterations to get within epsilon. Okay? So again, t is the number of iteration, epsilon is the gap. So number of iterations less than log n of epsilon squared is equivalent to the gap being square root log n over t. It's just algebra. Okay? So you keep that in mind. There's some t I switch back and forth between these t two. We, c we hope that we can prove that it's the same. Turns out it's very hard problem. And I get you the idea of how to prove these kind of lower bounds, at least for the Hadamard case. OK, now, I'm going to have to simplify the lower bound. And uh, this is, again, uh, sort of a, uh, an issue of st a study of sparsity, actually. How fast the value increases depends, of course, on the payoff matrix that sits there. The payoff matrix was the matrix that had all the weak learners as columns. It could be even infinitely big. That's the payoff matrix. Okay? And then it depends on which hypothesis the oracle pops in. Do you remember the oracle does this thing where it pops in weak learners? 
right? So which hypothesis the oracle gives you, hopefully it gives you ones of high edge, but greedily might not be the right way, because if it has foresight, it might even do better, right? Um, and then which distributions the algorithm chooses. You remember the algorithm chooses these distributions, which depend, which then might influence the oracle, and it gives you different weak learners. Okay. Now, all of these messy things we're going to get rid of in the following way. We just care about how many hypotheses you have. In other words, <clears throat> we're looking at the following quantity. The maximum, ut. ut always denotes any submatrix with t columns of u and value of ut. You see, so um, at this point, 15, I'm looking at all subsets of my matrix U with 15 columns, all submatrices with 15 columns. Look at the value of the game and take the maximum. Okay? So if you do this thing, if you can show that this goes up slowly, if this thing goes up slowly, then it will go up slowly for any algorithm um, that you can think of that follows the greedy paradigm of adding one hypothesis at a time. Okay, because any greedy algorithm at any at t, it has t hypotheses, no matter how it got it. It could do incredibly complicated planning. Forget about strong versus weak oracle, even more powerful. Any set of size t at any hypothesis set of size t at t iterations, this is going to be the upper bound. Okay? The conjecture is that there are matrices U such that it requires this many iterations to get within precision, to get the gap down to epsilon. Everybody understand what I'm doing? So lower bounds are messy. The, again, the choices are influenced by many things, but I got rid of it and turned it into a beautiful combinatorial problem by just analyzing this quantity. Okay, again, at this point, I'm going to look at all possible subsets of my matrix with 15 columns, take the maximum, and I claim that maximum, sort of the maximum for the best value for the best subset of columns, goes up slowly. That's what I want to prove. Okay, <clears throat> did that? Good. The simple case this kind of lower bound you get by using Hadamard matrices. Hadamard matrices are used all over machine learning to prove um, lower bounds, hardness results. They're particularly useful for hardness results against support vector machine type algorithms. Because these algorithms predict with linear combination of examples and the Hadamard matrices are designed so that the rows or the, and, and the columns, which would be the examples depending on how you do it, uh, are orthogonal. Okay, it's a long history of using these. They have a re recursive construction for it. If this is the H2, then you get the H4 by repeating it here and then taking the negation here. You can kind of see this. Now, this, these beautiful open problems regarding <coughs> Hadamard matrices. Um, they, <coughs> they are conjectured to exist for when the, the dimension is a multiple of four but nobody knows how to prove it. As a matter of fact, you have a choice in life. You can retire into the woods and um, sort of become a math monk and, you know, bread, butter, and a bunch of scraps of papers and work on these hard problems. And uh, uh, this is an example, and I give you a bunch of other hard problems. I have done this a couple of times in my life where I worked on very hard problems. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's, a, it's a high variance strategy. Uh, it can work, but high variance. OK. So, um, so what we're going to do is we take these matrices, you chop off the top row. For some reason, you can't use the top row. And then this, I claim, is our hard matrix that has this 1 of epsilon squared behavior. How do you prove something like this? Um, OK. So. Uh, this is the simplex, and this is the diamond. The, the simplex is probability vectors um, 
and the probability of is of course sum to one, and the weights are non-negative. Uh, the di's are non-negative. The diamond is I allow them to be negative, but I restrict the absolute norm. The value of the game, the value of the full matrix or any submatrix, the value of any matrix is defined as one of those minimax. This is minimum maximum edge kind of problem. Um, where normally in the previous thing I had here the simplex as well, so I generalize it a little bit and let this to be the, um, um, I add here the diamond. I generalize this simplex to the diamond. And if you do this, you can do a, smart, a, a, a small calculation and show that the value is bounded by this infinity norm. W in the simplex, UW infinity norm. Uh, this was, uh, we learned this from Nesterov, I think. Okay. Good. Nemrovsky. Uh, I get those two confused. Nemrovsky, okay. Good. Uh, a lot of this stuff, what I'm covering today, actually all of it, uh, basically uh, was pre uh, is coming from Vichy or worked out with Vichy, uh, in particular the optimization stuff. Um, I'm more of, I was more of the theoretician and then uh, Vichy brought in um, optimization into this research. Okay, so you, there's a relationship between the infinity norm and the one norm and then you take your value, which we rewrote this way, and you replace this infinity norm by the two norm using this little observation here. Then you expand this two norm as u u transpose. Now this is a submatrix of a Hadamard matrix essentially. Hadamard matrices are orthogonal, so essentially you get a diagonal matrix, a scale diagonal matrix out. There was a little bit of an issue because we threw away one of the columns. So you get some kind of a funny minus ones property. And this is fairly elementary simplification. You end up with that this being upalound by minus one over square root of two t. So it has the one over square root of t behavior, which corresponds to the one over epsilon squared behavior. Okay, so that's how this kind of bound goes. Pictorially, what happens is this. Okay, so this is our bound, the one over square root of t bound, minus one over square root of t bound. You see it goes to the, the gap E as epsilon. You need uh, one over epsilon squared to get with the, a gap down to epsilon. Value of the game is zero. <coughs> Here I plotted the curve for the Hadamard uh, when it was, the dimension was 128. Um, the construction for Hadamards are trivial when it's power of two. There's one that is, I think uh, constant times 12, but the general problem is open, whether they exist. So, but powers of two is the easiest. It follows the construction that I gave you before. Now, this curve is the one for Hadamard. To get this curve, <laughs> this is an approximate curve. Why? Well, if you have 80, you have t equals 80, you have to look at all subsets of size 80 of your Hadamard matrix with 128 columns and then take the maximum game value. You can only estimate that. I think we took uh, uh, 1,000 samples. <laughs> so the true curve might go a little bit higher. Okay. Now, the upper bound is of course above what we observe. Good, that's good. And um, this upper bound already gives the 1 over epsilon squared behavior, but we believe, we conjecture, there's actually a curve slightly higher than this, which corresponds to this kind of rate, that also upper bounds Hadamard. So Hadamard actually could be used to get this kind of a bound, which corresponds to this kind of a bound on the number of iterations. Okay? We don't know how to prove this. And as a matter of fact, we banged our head against the wall try to prove this, beautiful combinatorics, Hadamard matrices are just um, very tempting. You could spend a lifetime on this, very pretty. Um, and we found out that there's many, many other areas in combinatorics that use Hadamard matrices as well, and they sort of stuck at the same point, which tells you, oh, it's an interesting problem. <laughs> okay, good. 
Um, good. We actually believe we have a, a, another conjecture, which we haven't seen anywhere, uh, which is quite intriguing. We believe that, you know, every, give me any matrix U. Any matrix U with n rows that has this val has value 0 when you put the whole matrix together. We believe that for any matrix, the curve will always be above the Hadamard one. In other words, the Hadamard is the worst case. And <laughs> Ni Jia Song, uh, he's a student that is here, uh, he, uh, mine, that he proved that for n equals 4 and n equals 8, Hadamard is really the lowest curve. But we don't know how to prove it in general. Okay. Now, we also can use results that are in the literature, Klein and Young and Nemirovsky to some extent, to show that for random matrices, the value is uh, upper bounded by, um, by this. C times square root of log n over t, which gives you this kind of rates. But you have to require that your t is less than n over square root of n minus some small number. Or you, alternatively, your epsilon is less than 1 over square root of uh, n minus something. So it is, a, it is a messy proof. It uses forward, backward, Chernoff, very complicated. Um, but it shows that this rate is possible. The, the killer would be to show it for Hadamard, which we don't know how. OK, good. So this was everything I want to say about lower bounds. Now I'm going to do convex optimization again. Timing. OK, good, half an hour. Perfect. So here's the definition of convex function. These are some, um, um, these slides are from Vichy. Uh, you can lower bound a convex function by, uh, by a tangent plane. It's always on the outside. These pictures, you have seen this before. And then this, this immediately gives you a cutting plane method because you iteratively add these planes and you build sort of a box around it. You build a lower envelope. You see? This kind of thing. And the goal then is, is you have always an estimate of your optimum, which would be the lowest of the envelope, that point, versus the function which clearly lies above, and in particular, your lowest point where you evaluated the function. And then this is sort of your gap that you're looking at. And you want to get this as narrow as possible. Do you see this kind of game? Right? Very beautiful slides. Um, so basically, you upper bound your function by that cutting plane lower bound. And you iterate by, you always pick the next point to be the lowest of your envelope. And then you evaluate, and then you have another segment and continue. See? So this would be your next point to look at. And then you want the duality gap as small as possible. Right? The duality gap is this little thing. OK, so what if the function is non smooth? OK, so then you need to do the subgradients. And everything works out with the subgradients. That's the point. Your methods still work. The cutting make plane methods still work with subgradients. Okay. So boosting was one of those optimization problems. As a matter of fact, the optimization function looked like this. Okay. So the beautiful thing <laughs> is, and I learned this from Vichy, that for some reason, if you take the gradient of this function here, this function f of d, this, 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 this function, this blue function here, if you take the gradient of this, it's the arc, it's the arc max of, um, it's the arc max of u and u. In other words, it returns you the strong oracle. Okay. So at any particular trial, when you have t hypotheses, there would be ut here, ut, and then a ut here. And your subgradient would you return you, no, sorry, wrong. Uh, u is the whole matrix that is out there. 
right? You already chosen a submatrix. U is the whole matrix. You compute this minimum with respect to the whole matrix that's out there, and it returns you the one that of minimum, of maximum edge, and that's the strong oracle. It's kind of cool that there's this connection. Uh, I want a simple proof of this, Vichy. I want a simple proof of this. This is the argument. Yeah. Okay. And then the gradient of it is nothing but the R max at that particular thing. Kind of simple it Okay. Good. So now when you have these non continuous things, you have instabilities because of the subgradient. Right? So so there's a bunch of subgradients. Do you see that? Uh, picking up Arbitrary subgradient causes instability. And uh, what we do is we add a little bit of regularization. So here's the notion of strong convexity. We usually talked about that already. You lower bound the function by a quadratic. Okay? So it's equivalent to saying that uh, the second derivative is lower bounded by, by a multiple of the identity. And so a function is strongly convex, sorry, it's strongly convex if it's <clears throat> the Bregman divergence defined by that function is lower bounded by quadratic. Okay? Good. Now, if you do that, then things become smooth, and then you use that somehow. Okay, so these are the bundle methods. You add, and many people have discovered this, um, I don't read that many papers, so I discover everything myself. Uh, but uh, Vichy is kind of a person, I use him a lot because he, he reads more. He makes all these, he's a connection type person. I'm, I home cook. <laughs> so, so, uh, so you take regularization plus uh, this kind of objective, and um, the question is what kind of um, regularization and what kind of strong, what kind of, what do you should you add to in, to to enforce strong convexity? Again, you do the same thing. You uh, you you iterate is the argument of your approximation, and uh, you stop when the duality gap is small. Okay, so the number of iterations you you use. Um, is bounded like this. And um, if your regularization term is at most epsilon over 2, right, then if you show that this approximate is less than epsilon, and this is less than epsilon over 2, you can move this to the other side. You can replace this by the optimum value, and then you get that the value of the, the current solution is at most epsilon away from the optimum. In a picture, here's the picture again. Um, here's the now function with the approximation, with the regularization. And if you show that this gap is small, then you're close to the optimum. Then this thing is close to the optimum. You see? Here's your best current solution. Here's the optimum. If this gap is small, then the difference between this is small. This kind of game. Okay? Okay, for boosting, what do you use? For boosting, what you use is relative entry regularizer. Right? And you choose your learning rate, this is the inverse learning rate, judiciously. <coughs> This is going to become obvious in a moment. Uh, yeah, if you do that, because this is at most log n, then you get that this whole term, the omega term, is at most epsilon over 2. So it's strongly convex using this modulus or constant. OK, so immediately you get these kind of bounds. OK. 
Okay. And um, so this is the, we did, uh, uh, you get lower bounds for the strong, you get uh, upper bounds for the strong oracle this way. You can also get similar upper bounds if you use the weak oracle. Okay. In optimization theory, they also did distinguishing, did this distinguish between strong and weak oracle, all on different names, but it's all the same thing. Okay. Now, towards a practical boosting algorithm. So this is just talking about how fast you converge. But then we still have to find, you have to plug in some kind of an optimization that finds us these minimums. Unfortunately, we then have to use uh, standard stuff, gradient descent based stuff, as you will see. Okay? So here's the optimization problem for boosting. Here's the dual. Uh, you want to minimize this uh, function f. Unfortunately, the way we do it currently, because we want to do large scale problems, we have to use what's around. What's around is always 99% gradient descent based stuff. The stuff based on the multiplicative updates or entry regularization has not been developed yet. Not as fully. There's inklings of it. We're working on it. A lot of people are trying, but it's harder. So you do gradient descent bias things. Now you go outside. Uh, you have to get the learning rate right. <laughs> 1 over t is roughly the decay schedule. Um, and then if you work on a simplex, you have to project. I know for a fact that this projection-based method in principle, not very good <laughs> because they forget. But we need to do it anyway because that's the best thing we have at this point. Uh, and here's the method that, we, that our algorithms use. It's called BMR. BMRM. -M. Okay, BMRM. Okay, if you want me to correct something, let me know. So it's a great, it's essentially a projected, you see here, projected <laughs> gradient based method. And then there's a bunch of heuristics for, cute, for tuning the learning rates and so forth. All these packages we have on the web, uh, you can try, your, try it on your favorite data. What data do we have? Okay, so our goal was People worked on AdaBoost. AdaBoost, if you run it on normal data sets, people did it basically on toy data sets. Toy meaning in relation to what people have been do doing on SVMs, they are small. So we wanted to, our goal was to run boosting algorithms on data sets about as big as SVM, the biggest SVM data sets. We went quite a ways. We're not there yet. Because then, only then do you have a fair comparison. So here are some of the data sets we used, um, reasonably sized. Okay, and we did usual split uh, uh, of between uh, training and test set. A lot of these experiments were done with Karen Glosher and previously Jun Liao. Okay, first. Observe, remember in my previous lecture, I harped a lot about that these linear programming algorithms, LP boost, is brittle. You see it in the experiments. So here I plot the generalization error of LP boost versus iteration number. You kind of see that it, it jiggles around a lot. Do you see? Right? It focuses on a small set of examples and jiggles around it. This is now a practical data set. Uh, it is not as bad in all data sets. Uh, here it's pretty good, right? It's pretty stable. Who knows? It's welcome to machine learning. <laughs> it's a mess. But, uh, <clears throat> but on this data set, it was very bad. Okay, so th the thing is, here's the data set. Here's the algorithm. SVM here means that, <laughs> it's a bad name, uh, it's it was some kind of a weak hypothesis that was based on a single example. I was 
telling Karen, compare against SVM and so forth. So then she called that weak learner SVM. It's not an SVM. It just identifies the weak learner that we used. In various other cases, we used decision stumps. On this data set, it was OK. Now, on this data set, it was also OK. OK, so it depends. If the data set, as I said, has a lot of randomness intuitively, then LB boost is not thrown off as badly, in particular if you would average over a number of data sets. Now, on all the data sets we have, if you add relative entropy regularization with various learning rates, it always stabilizes it. It never is brittle. You understand? So we did this. Here is all the same data sets with different learning rates. Learning rates affect things. Right? Any questions so far? Why did you stop on the blue curve? Say it again. Why did you stop on the blue curve so early? Uh, don't remember. Time, maybe. Uh, no, I think once the once your gap. Oh, the gap was reached. Once the optimization gap is reached, you stop. It, it just doesn't generalize all that well. So. Ah. It's the same optimization gap. We stopped at the same gap, but the generalization error behaved this way. OK, good. Thank you. Thanks for Vichy. See, I have Vichy here. No problem. Um, <laughs> so now, um, so this is entropy regular LP boost. The regularization, so far we have LP boost unstable, regularization stabilizes things, right? Now I want to look at um, the, the generalization area as a function of the learning rate. <clears throat> so this kind of curve. It's very important to do this kind of curves when you solve a pro practical problem because um, who cares about the theory, right? The theory says one thing. Uh, usually the learning rates prescribed by the theoretical bounds have very little to do with what works in practice. So you have to do these kind of curves. You have to check different learning rates. You also have to be very careful as to when you publish your results as to the precision according to which you computed your, your results. Because <laughs> if you do low precision, that's an implicit regularization. Okay, So you might not be able to rep repeat other people's results because they computed according to a different precision. Okay, So this is your ADA. You expect there be a valley, right? Eta has to be chosen optimally. If it's too small, then you, in our case, what this means is uh, you don't have enough regularization, LP boost. Now, infinite means LP boost. Uh, and small means um, you have, you believe the entropy too much. You stay put where you are. So they sort of these valley curves. This is a little bit, uh, uh, I don't know why that's there. Uh, welcome to the real world. Uh, and, uh, but usually you get these kind of va uh, reasonable valleys. OK? Question so far? Yes? The generalization error bound, how is that computed? Is it like training or test set error? Or yeah, Tra test set. We hopefully were honest. But you know, this whole thing about splitting your data into you know, ideally, you're only allowed to use the data set once. But we, we kind of use it many, many times, split many times, and so forth, beat the, beat the things till the end. In some sense, we're overfitting, and it's a little bit of a fake thing um, uh, to say that, uh, to report generalization error, because we tried many things. Do, if you want to be really proper, then you have to have two agents. One agent. Um, holds out your data set, and you, can only, and you can only do the test once, technically. But modulo all of these things that everybody else does, we did pretty thorough experiments. Well, I mean, versus something like a fact-based, or, or like, a, like with the SVM, can you estimate that with the margin? Um, um, it's not something inherently algorithm. This is experiments. We report generalization error on a holdout data set, okay. averaged over many draws. Yeah? Um, yeah, pack B is all interesting theoretical bounds. Uh, I studied some of these, but 
depends on what kind of a hat I put on, right? If I talk at cold, then I lots bounce. If I talk to practical people, then you want to be a little bit more humble and uh, talk about real experiments. Okay. So here uh, some other plots. Generalization error versus number of weak hypotheses, so sparsity of the solution. Interesting plot. Here's ERLP. Generalization error is pretty small amongst the best, and it has a small number of hypotheses. Now here, watch this. This is LP boost, much smaller, much smaller number of hypotheses, but bad in a generalization error, right? too sparse. So this is kind of a sweet spot. This was a binary a relative entropy regularized LP boost. Uh, it's slight, slightly better in this context. Um, uh, it's a long story. Uh, essentially, when you want to have optimization problems, you have inequality constraints introduced by capping. I know sort of at a gut level, you never want to use inequality constraints. You always want to replace them by barrier functions. So we did replace the capping constraints by entropic barrier functions, and then we hoped it to be better, but so far the differences were not so big. Here's Adaboost. Adaboost, in this example, has reasonable generalization error, but long, large number of weak hypotheses. This is the corrective ERLP boost. And uh, SVM got error rate very similar to all these algorithms. Welcome to machine learning. Very half SVM and these boosting algorithms, totally different algorithms, totally different families, totally different way of building hypotheses. And very often, on many data sets, the performance is very similar. I can get you artificial data sets where I beat the hell out of SVM, no matter what kernel is used. But on many real world data sets, often things are, are comparable. Uh, you would use them all in parallel. You, uh, uh, the weak learners there would be, oh, the weak learners there are there, the number of support vectors. Huh? There is no weak learners. Yes, it is not. There is no weak learners. Yes, but to some extent there is also something there. There is something there uh, that is in some sense corresponding, which would be the number of support vectors. The number of features, but, yeah. but here you see, look, uh, the, this plot has no number of features. The SVM blue curve is just plotted for comparison to show what is the best, what is the optimal performance uh, that SVMs can achieve, and then how does it relate to the other, to the other. I think if it looks for some sense of like that pop hypothesis, the SVMs, you can compare that all, compare that all along with the hypotheses of all the weak learners of all the boosters. Say it again. I guess you could only do it via the number of support vectors, but we didn't do that. We don't, because that's not quite the fair comparison. Right, right. Yeah, incomparable families. So here again, similar picture. Um, the generalization error of ERLP boost and the boosting arms is better than LP, uh, but LP has smaller number of hypotheses. Sparsity hurts you. Uh, here's another example set, it continues. So it's pretty consistent. <coughs> okay. So now I plotted corrective versus totally corrective. Oh, corrective algorithms process one hypothesis at a time. The classical algorithm is Adaboost. It has the property that it process the last hypothesis, makes the edge of the last hypothesis zero. Totally corrective algorithm, look at the edges of all the previous hypotheses and push them down. ERLP boost is the classical case. So I run uh, ERLP boost against its corrective version. This was done by uh, Singer. I don't, if I would put in ADA boost, then the differences would be even more extreme. So in this case, I plot the gap, that I, uh, the duality gap versus iteration. 
and uh, because I want to see how fast they converge. Do you see? Good, because they work on the same optimization problem. Good. So um, ERLP boost uses much smaller it number of iterations. They were stopped at the same gap or something like that. Okay. Um, use has a small number of iterations. That's sort of the consistent thing here. Sometimes it does much better in some data sets. Okay, this is number of iterations. Now, here I plot versus time, versus time, total time used. Right, because you see, it's unfair to count iterations because ERLP people spends much more time per iteration than the corrective algorithms. So I compare gap versus time spent, and now the situation is different. For some data sets, one algorithm wins for some the other. Okay, so the corrective algorithm here requires more time. Uh, the, yeah, this is less time. The ERLP boost, the fancy algorithm, requires more time. And the situation is like this, but in some cases it is flipped. Okay, it depends on the data set. It depends essentially how expensive it is, how much you spend for the weak learner. If you spend a lot of time for the weak learner, then the ELP boost has more, has the advantage. You see? So there's these trade-offs. Now, there, <clears throat> we also checked if you use different optimizers. There's a bunch of different optimizers that you can plug into um, BMRM, and uh, we tried a bunch of them. They're public optimizers. Some of them are p you have to pay for. And uh, the results are sensitive to these different optimizers. Okay, so there's a bunch of plots like that to, get to, to show that, the time changes and so forth. Okay, now here's the effect of nu. If you have an inseparable case, we had these slack variables that are weighted by nu, do you remember? It was related to the capping. And again, you would want to have one of those valley curves to two nu optimally, and it's true, there's valleys. So that was a, another good check. Questions? So a lot of time went into this, um, thanks to Karen Klosher, Jun Liao, and all these people, uh, uh, they did a lot of experiences, a lot of work. <clears throat> but we're not there yet. We're not there yet. Again, if you compare SVM, simple optimization, quadratics, why do we do quadratic? Well, derivatives of quadratic are linear, and linear is easy. That's why we do it. Uh, here we have a softmap problem, log exp, it's messy. Decade of experience, actually a lot of the optimization literature goes back to, of course, much earlier than SVMs. It goes back essentially to the physicists. They had Newton's method, approximate Newton's method, and so forth. Here we're just starting. Uh, we, have, we can handle sort of 10 to the 6 points, and here we're still smaller. Uh, the code is freely available. Uh, Vichy has it. Somewhere? On his homepage. On his homepage. So you have any problems, you go to his homepage. So, um, and um, we want to scale to larger data sets. There's lots of room for improvement. We want to get the optimization code, the optimization literature, to work directly on the simplex with relative entry regularization using strong convexity with respect to not the two norm, but the one norm, and developing this whole family of things. Okay? So, connections between boosting and optimization, bring in tropical regularization up to par with squared Euclidean distance regularization, look for data sets that exploits the merit of the new algorithms. So what happens is, I do not want to say that boosting algorithms are better than SVM. No, <laughs> not at all. They're incomparable, okay? But we need to understand on what data set, what family does well. That's very important, OK? 
Okay? You can do artificial data sets, or you can hopefully have practical data sets. Right now, all the data sets, big data sets that are around, are biased towards SVM. Why? Because people play with SVMs, publish results on SVM, uh, do gradient descent by algorithms. They want to look, they make the algorithms look good, so they, they only work on certain data sets, and those the ones are in the literature. The other ones are not in the literature. So if you go ahead and <clears throat> run boosting algorithms on the big data sets that are available, you will always fail. You have to build a whole community around multiplicative updates so that they explore different types of data sets, explore different kind of combinatorics, find data sets on which they work, and so forth. Okay? So it's a sociological problem. Not to be underestimated. Um, okay, better lower bounds, the missing log n. And acknowledgments. Rob Shapira and your friend for pioneering boosting. Gunnar Raj, in his thesis, brought in, uh, he, I got into boosting because of him. He brought in optimization. And Karen Glosher helped with the pictures, the plots. Jun Liao before that with experiments. Uh, Ni Jia Zong recently with the lower bounds. And of course, Vichy for teaching me the latest optimization tricks. So is there any questions? Yes? You just mentioned uh, uh, boost, I mean, many work, uh, data case, cases, uh, boosting method and uh, SVM have similar results. Often, yeah. Uh, is but that for, just for linear SVM or non-linear? Oh, it, it's messy. Uh, this is a very sloppy statement. Um, if you look at your favorite dirty data sets, this happens very often. You try lots of different machine learning algorithms, and they're all very close to each other. It's, it's just sort of a general off-the-record off the remark. Uh, you try nearest neighbor, you get a certain percentage. You try SVM, you get a certain percentage. And then uh, you try boosting, you get the same percentage. And then you spend, you, you get that in the first week, on the first day or something, when you throw these algorithms in it. And then you spend another year, and you shave off one more percent. That's usually what happens in machine learning with one of the algorithms. So that doesn't matter. Linear. No, there is no general statement. So this is often what happens in. But I cannot say I can't. There is no theorem there. Okay. <laughs> it's just like what happens very often. Also, there is a bias in the way the public data sets are selected. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, the bias is always selected towards algorithms that work. And the current favorite is uh, uh, support vector machines. So the selection is big data sets that are around favor support vector machines. I can give you theoretical data sets based on Hadamard matrices where, <laughs> we spent a lot of time on this, where you can show that um, <clears throat> any boosting type algorithm um, cannot learn these problems. Uh, you, 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 no matter, no, any SVM type algorithm uh, spends, is, uh, is very, very bad compared to the multiplicative updates. You can construct theoretical examples, um, but we haven't seen a huge domain where the typical data set favors the multiplicative updates, or a typical, a huge domain where the typical data set in that brain domain favors SVM. That's what I'm looking for. I want to have, let's say, if you do spam um, classification a certain way with certain features, then typically this algorithm family is better. If you do it another way, then this other, and this is what we don't have yet. It is out there. Um, and it's quite actually quite interesting um, to find such natural data sets that bring out the incomparability. Theoretically, it has been brought out in terms of dual norms and so forth. I had a lot of fun developing this. But practically, it has not. You can do good theoretical work, and you can do pr good practical work. Okay, Both are hard. <laughs> Questions? Is there a way to search 
that's what how, how I would do. I would look at that Hardamart example, it's in the Leaving the Span paper, and go from there and look for natural data sets. Um, in some sense, I'll get to you in a moment. Uh, in the theoretical literature, the problem that favors the multiplicative update is learning disjunctions with a small mistake bound. That's the first problem that has been looked at. Uh, we know it does it much better than Perceptron, and it has papers that bring this out, the difference between the two. So fine, there it's fine. You could probably find data sets where small disjunctions have the advantage, and then, you know, but I would like to have in the UCI database <laughs> uh, something like data sets favored by one versus the other. Really, really interesting thing. Yes? Yes. It actually so happens that boosting is pretty amazingly good. Boosting the distribution is pretty good. And there are some cases where you may want to use boost the distribution for, say, kernel maintenance. For instance, if you care about reasonably fast runtimes, your trees are actually fast. And boost the distribution gets you to a very good function class of substantially inexpensive, faster than what you would have to do with a kernel maintenance. So selecting data sets, my comments uh, about f data sets favored by SVM, it's mo mostly about the, the public data sets that are discussed in the UCI database type things. In a company setting, of course, they have the data set first. I agree with, him, uh, with uh, Alex completely, and then they look for the best algorithm. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think this is an ideal uh, uh, time to stop and, <laughs> and continue and continue the discussion during lunch. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>